All right. Well, I have a picture that hangs prominently in my office here at church. If you can see it, it's a, it actually it doesn't show up too well on the screen there. But come on up to my office sometime and look at it. It's a picture of Walt Disney, sort of a, a, a faint picture of him, standing on a uh, just, just sand of central Florida. And then what doesn't quite show up in that screen is the castle that Walt Disney had envisioned in the swampland of central Florida. Trust me, it's a great picture. <laughs> and it reminds me of the power of vision. That's why I have it hanging there. As, as, I, as all of us are stuck in the day-to-day -day ministries of our church, just it's tempting to lose sight of the bigger vision and the importance of articulating bigger vision as to where God is calling us to go and who God is calling us to be as a church. Researcher George Barna has observed one of the main differences between healthy churches and stagnant churches is vision. He says, in every one of the growing healthy churches that he studied, a discernible link has been forged between the spiritual and numerical growth of those congregations and the existence, articulation, and widespread ownership of God's vision for ministry by the leaders and participants of the church. Conversely, he says, visionless congregations fail to experience spiritual and numerical growth. Now, here at Venice Presbyterian Church, the session, which is our group of elders who lead the church, has, has developed visions in, in recent years for particular areas of our church. We've developed a vision for what we wanted our session to look like, a community of spiritual leaders who prayerfully discern God's will and shepherd the congregation as a whole, as opposed to a board of directors of different leaders who oversee particular areas of ministry. We developed a vision for managing the church's finances and properties. We established a board of trustees, and with the trustees who were elected by this congregation, brought new definition and purpose to our endowment funds. We developed a vision for ministry with younger generations, designing a strategy that emphasizes going out to serve and bless kids and families rather than just waiting to receive them when they come here. We developed a vision for worship and arts that has emphasized goals like establishing a concert series to bless our community and to celebrate different forms and styles of music in our worship services and, and to emphasize collaboration among our staff and the planning of worship so that the music and visual arts and spoken word are woven with all of the worship elements together into an integrated whole. And of course, we developed a vision for our, our, utility, our, our properties, our facilities, construction of a chapel, music suite, new welcoming narthex, improving the safety and traffic flow of our parking lot, redesigning the glass house, enhancing the memorial garden. So we have been engaging in a lot of visioning throughout the years for different areas of our church's life and ministry. And it's time now to, to revisit these visions and the others that have been developed for different programs and ministries of our church, and it's time to align, align our varied visions into an overall defining vision of who God is calling Venice Presbyterian Church to be and what God is calling Venice Presbyterian Church to emphasize as we approach the year 2020. Now, I know that seems like a long way off, but it really isn't. And we don't know for sure what we may be facing in 2020, but we can discern and define a vision that God is giving us and move with increasing intentionality into that future. Now, we can certainly hold on to our church's mission statement, to know Christ and to make Christ known. This mission statement, which was adopted in 2003, has been helpful. It's kept us focused on emphasizing Christ and the importance of a relationship with Christ. It's helped focus us outward to make Christ known in our wider community and around the world. And so this mission statement to know Christ and to make Christ known, it's great. But it's more of a theological purpose statement than a vision. 
To know Christ and to make Christ known, as many of you know, is not unique to our church. There are hundreds, probably thousands of churches that have this as an explicit mission statement. And, frankly, every church should have it as a theological purpose statement because isn't that part of what every church is called to do, to know Christ and to make Christ known. While a theological purpose is something that is unchanging across time, a church's vision, at least as I understand it, is something that's bound to change over time as led by the Holy Spirit. One religious researcher who's a professor of religion at Regent University <coughs> offers, I think, this helpful distinction. He says, vision is a subpoint to the theological purpose. The main focus of the church is its theological purpose. The vision needs to go a step farther than that. It needs to get people excited about what the church is doing and who are the people God is calling this church to reach. A church's vision is a compelling picture of what God is calling a specific congregation to do in the near-term future. It's a clear, focused purpose for this unique church in this particular community, in this distinct moment in history. It's a clear, focused purpose. A compelling, overarching vision shapes the life of a congregation and its activities. The vision becomes the touchstone for evaluating what we're doing and how we're doing it. A vision helps us determine priorities, budget priorities, staffing priorities, publicity priorities. It helps us evaluate new things as they come to us and also helps us to evaluate things we have been doing. So it's a clear, focused purpose for this unique congregation. We are a unique church. Every congregation is a unique church. There are some things that have been unique about this church since its founding in 1953, and part of discovering God's vision for any time in a church's life is paying attention to the DNA that is in that church, that is unique to that church. And we also, I think, as we think about the uniqueness of our church, have to keep in mind a kingdom view. Did you know there are nearly 40 churches in the city of Venice alone? 40 Christian churches in the city of Venice alone. Each of these churches is made up of wonderful people doing wonderful ministry. But there's a problem. I think it's well pointed out by church consultant Jerry Graham. Most churches don't like to specialize. We all want to be full service churches, even when we don't have the resources. We try to be all things to all people, surrounded by other churches, vainly trying the same thing. And the result? We're often bland and mediocre. Recently, I asked our staff in our session to consider to think about these nearly 40 churches in, in, in the Venice township where we live and to really consider which of these churches, including our own, can be distinguished among the others for a compelling vision. How are we distinguished beyond just a denominational label? In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul uses the body metaphor, describing the church as the body of Christ. And usually these texts are interpreted in the local congregation, talking about each member of that local congregation having a different role to play. We are each, as individuals, members, parts of the body of Christ, the local congregation. But what if we thought about this in a much larger sense? You know, when Paul was writing his letters, his letters were written to churches in that community, the church at Rome, the church at Corinth, the church at Ephesus. And within each of those cities, there were local assemblies and congregations. What if we thought about this idea of the body of Christ, recognizing with a kingdom view that here in the city of Venice, each of the local congregations has a unique role to play in carrying out the mission of God, complementing each other, working together in synergy for the glory of God. 
So the vision that we're seeking to discover will be a clear focus purpose for this unique church in this particular community. Venice is unique. South Sarasota County is unique. And many of the things that work up north or in other communities may not necessarily translate or work as well in this corner of southwest Florida. And it's important for us to gain as much understanding as we can about the community where we live. Not just the community that's within these walls, but the community where God has placed us here in Venice, Florida. And all of this is for a distinct moment in history. Now Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the word of God is timeless, unchanging. At the same time, the kingdom of God is dynamic. Always changing and growing to meet the needs of a changing culture. And this understanding is particularly true of our Presbyterian Reformed tradition, which holds as one of our banner phrases that the church is reformed and always reforming according to the word of God. And I believe for every local church, God has divine visions for that church for appointed seasons. And just reflecting on our own history at Venice Presbyterian Church, I believe that God had a divinely appointed season for the outdoor church. That was the beginning of this church's history. Something for which this church was known in the community and beyond this community, frankly. I believe God had a divinely appointed season for the early childhood center that many of you will remember here at the church. That blessed this community in serving the families and their needs richly for a divinely appointed season. I believe there was a divinely appointed season in this church's life for a parish nurse program that not only cared for this congregation, but, but our community and a health ministry that was known in this community as, as a distinguishing mark of this church and how it glorified God. And so before us is the question, what are the ways God is calling us to bless others? over the next chapter of the church's mission. What are the ways God is calling us to know Christ and make Christ known over the next chapter of this church's mission? Well, as we begin this new year, we will be discerning God's will together. And discernment, I love this word. Discernment is a rich word that, that really conjures up the images of of reflection, and I would say prayer. It means really to see or to know what already is, to, to bring it into a more clear focus. Discernment is to see, to notice the movement of God. It's to see from God's perspective. The discernment process is one of uncovering the vision not of creating a vision. Because, of course, the Spirit prays within us. The Spirit prays within us with sighs too deep for words, Paul says. As we listen to the Spirit, those prayers begin to surface into our consciousness. Now, as your senior pastor, it will be my role to lead us all in this discernment process. And the session the elders elected by this congregation, are, according to our Presbyterian way of doing things, the ones who will, who will really lead the process of bringing this vision into focus. As we listen to the whole congregation, as we listen to our community, as we, above all, listen to God. Because, let's not forget, the source of the vision is God. Now, it may sound very mystical and perhaps even manipulative when church leaders talk about a vision coming from God. But I believe with all my heart that the vision is not ours to create. The vision is ours to discover. As we prayerfully look and listen, noticing where God is 
already at work, observing how God has already shaped and gifted our church and paying attention to the people whom God is bringing into our sphere of influence. Terry Fulham, who was a great Episcopal priest and a visionary leader in the church, once expressed, vision arises out of our burden to know the will of God, to become whatever it is God wants us to become. So you see, this, this translates not just to vision for the church, but for our own lives as well. He says, vision is also the product of God working in us. He creates the vision, and we receive it. It becomes a rallying point, a goal toward which we move as his people. When we seek God's will, nothing less Nothing else. God will bless his church. God will provide. God will embolden. God will be glorified. To help us understand a little bit about discerning the will of God, I share with us just these two verses that begin the 12th chapter of Romans, where Paul said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So how do we discern what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God for our lives and for the church? Well, Paul says, first of all, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. That's your act of spiritual worship. Now, that's a pretty graphic picture that Paul is painting, presenting our bodies, our whole selves, as living sacrifices. Remember, in his culture, part of the Jewish temple worship was bringing sacrifices. And Paul's saying, instead of bringing those external sacrifices, bring yourself as a living sacrifice to God. So what Paul is saying here is for us, First of all, to be able to really discern God's will for our own lives and for the church, we've got to really rediscover what it means to worship. What it means for us to worship God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, not just come to church, but to truly present ourselves to God as living sacrifices. And then Paul said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And the tense of the verb is keep being transformed. It's a continual thing our whole life long. Keep being transformed by the renewing of your minds. And so one of the questions we each have to ask ourselves is how are we allowing ourselves to be conformed to the world? How is the world pressing us into its mold so that we no longer are that salt and light, that distinctive, beautiful uh, person that God created you and I to be in Christ. In terms of seeking God's vision for the church and for our own lives, I think we need to avoid being pressed into how the world says to operate. Remembering that God's wisdom, God's wisdom, the Bible says, is foolishness to the world. So, you may be wondering, so what does all this mean for our life together as a congregation? Well, there are some vision discernment steps that I'd just like to cover briefly. Five steps that we'll be going through together. And the first step, the most important one to remember, is spiritual preparation. This has already been starting among our church's leadership. The session has been talking about this process for months and praying the staff, the elders, and other key leaders, we're currently studying a book together, a book by a pastor named Craig Groeschel called It. How churches and leaders can get it and keep it. And in this book, Groeschel talks about that it factor. That's really another way of thinking about vision. What is each church's it factor that that the members are buzzing with, that the community is buzzing with. There's a lot of provocative questions in this book. Not that we're going to copy everything that Craig Groeschel says to do, but he's inviting us to begin asking this question. What is it that makes a church 
have that it factor. And over the next few weeks, through our messages, we'll be looking at some of the important things to recognize when we are together seeking God's vision. And these messages, they'll focus on our vision process as a church, but, but please hear me, they'll also relate to each of our individual lives. Because it's important for every single one of us to seek what is God's vision for my life. What is God's vision for your life? How does each of us discover God's purpose for our foreseeable future? What is it for each of us to think about God giving us a clear, focused purpose for a specific person, for you, for me, in this particular context where God has placed you at this distinct particular time in history at this distinct time in your life? And if you're asking these questions for yourself, it can only help our church's process of discerning God's vision. Asking these questions for ourselves will lead each of us to seek the face of God, to pray, to reflect on the things of eternal value, to get us thinking forward. God's purposes for our local church will be fueled by the purposes and passions that he plants in each of our hearts. So the spiritual preparation, it is the most vital step. And it's so tempting to launch into our human planning and strategizing. But we are committed to seeking God's will, nothing less, nothing else. And so some of the other steps, briefly, we'll be going through a time of self-awareness, asking questions of who is Venice Presbyterian Church? Who are we? What are our core values? How has our history shaped us? What are the key strengths about this church? What's so good about VPC that you hope it never changes? And what does our church maybe do as well as any church in this community or anywhere Asking these questions will help us gain more self-awareness, and this will involve all of us as a congregation. February 18th and 19th, Ministry Architects will be joining us, and actually, it's an organization, but specifically, there are two pastors, local pastors, who in addition to pastoring their congregations, who understand this community to some extent, will be facilitating listening groups. The session just wanted a third-party group who is experienced in helping church lead helping lead church visioning processes to come in. And so every one of you, you'll be hearing more about this, will be invited to participate. We waited to do this until the winter season, recognized that part of the uniqueness of the community is our snowbirds. We want you to be part of this. You don't need to necessarily even be a member of this church. Just come. You'll hear more about this. But this ministry architect will say more about this, but the two local pastors are Steve McConnell, the pastor at Church of the Palms in Sarasota, and Devin Bicer Andrews, who grew up in this church and is now pastor of the Winter Garden Presbyterian Church in Port Charlotte. They'll be the ones who will be facilitating these listening groups. So we'll have this time of self-awareness and then we'll also engage in studying the community. Demographic data, yes. But even more, we have been blessed by a resource that is free to churches in our presbytery called Mission Insight, which through all kinds of marketing tools helps us really get a handle, an interesting insight into the preferences, the desires, the yearnings of, of, our, of you and me and our neighbors. It's fascinating. And, and our session will be presenting some of this, this material to our congregation at our annual meeting on April the 10th. And then we'll be taking all of this into consideration as we sense the vision. God's vision will come into focus. And the session is committed to waiting on God's timing here. But then as this vision becomes more clear and there's the resonance with each of us, we will set the course for 2020. 
Now, it was interesting. I, I didn't know until this week, as I was preparing this message, that this phrase, setting the course, comes from sailing. A course, as I've come to understand, on a, on a square rigged ship, is the lowest and the greatest surface area sail on a mast. And so setting a course means opening that huge sail up to catch the wind which propels the ship forward. So as we set that course and catch the wind of the Holy Spirit, God will inspire us to communicate this vision and live into this vision. God will lead us to set this course and then we will stay the course with God's wind propelling us forward. Let's pray. Lord, we sit before you and we ask that you grant us your grace to be able to sit before you in very meaningful and intentional ways over these weeks and months to come as we seek your vision for this church. We thank you for planning this church here in Venice and we know, Lord, that you continue to have great plans for this local congregation in every part of the body of Christ. And Lord, as we engage in this adventure as a congregation, Lord, may you also speak through the gentle voice of your Holy Spirit to each of us as individuals. Granting us the gift of getting greater clarity about who we are as individuals, about what you are calling us to do and to be in the place where you have planted us for this time in our lives. Oh Lord, we look forward to this not with fear, but with excitement. Believing God that you do speak. You do reveal and you do want each of us and you want your church to thrive. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand and sing together these lyrics to a familiar song.
So may we go forward content not to just merely exist as individuals or as God's people together, but let's go forth dreaming. Dreaming of what God can yet do through this church and through your life. And know that as we go, we never go alone. For we carry with us the power of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is with us always. Amen.